Today, we are answering your questions, and I say we because I have invited our 18-year-old son, Oakley Robbins, onto the podcast because so many of the questions that I'm getting from listeners around the world are related to either the teens or young adults in your life. Oakley has not seen these questions. Are we going? We're just, we're we're just jumping going. right in? We're just going. Really? Yes. That's a question? Right there. Oh, I love you. Hey, it's your friend Mel, and welcome to the Mel Robbins Podcast. Today, we are answering your questions, and I say we because I have invited our 18-year-old son, Oakley Robbins, onto the podcast because so many of the questions that I'm getting from listeners around the world are related to either the teens or young adults in your life. You're worried about them. You want to know how to connect with them. You're worried about their anxiety, about things that are going on at school or in college. And so I thought, why don't we just get Oakley in the seat? And Oak, you can do your best to explain what the average teenager or young adult is thinking as we answer questions from people around the world, okay? Sounds great. All right. Anything else that you think people should know before we jump in? I'm psyched to be here. Super glad to be back. Oh my gosh, I'm psyched to be back too. All right, so I'm just, here's how it's going to roll. Oakley has not seen these questions. I have a stack of literally several hundred questions. It's and huge. these are just, it's a, very thick, yeah. A sample <laughs> of the ones that we've got in the last 48 hours. Um, and I'm just going to. Are we going? We're just, we're, we're jumping just going. right in. We're just going. Perfect. Let's go for it. All right, great. Here's the first one. Why is it so hard to get my sons to talk? When my 18-year-old is upset, he stops talking to all of us. Mm. Well, I think for some people, I mean, everybody processes like annoyance and anger differently. And I mean, I'm no expert psychologist, but I feel like sometimes the way that men or boys can process uh, uh, anger is they need time to themselves and they don't want to talk about it. Um, it's also a bit of a norm for men to just be closed off in general and not really share how they feel in general. And he may be falling under that category, which is a possibility because boys at high school don't like to share how they feel most of the time. Why? A uh, sign of weakness, I guess. Uh, a worry that to show how you truly feel if you're upset or angry um, it's not masculine which is a word that people throw around and they hope to achieve Um, but I think that it's not because your son is angry with you or doesn't like you it's because he feels as though what he needs to be doing to achieve a certain standing in a social hierarchy or the life he's living right now is to not share and to stay quiet. Oh, so uh, in the life of the average teenage or young adult male, social hierarchy, like the guys that are like quiet and broody, like that's, that's like a plus. Like you normally don't share if you're sad, you share like anger is something people share. Okay. Um, but like sadness, uh, like if you're, Uh, I guess into somebody like you don't really people don't really share that because I guess that isn't very uh, masculine, I guess, is the word that people use. Really? If you like someone? Mm -hmm. Wow. You got to like pretend like you don't care. Yeah. Wow. So let's break this question apart a little bit because I notice particularly in the mornings or at the end of the day, if you got a lot of homework, you're usually pretty pissed off and grouchy and it is obvious to me, particularly in the mornings, that you do not want me talking to you. Yeah, and you do a great job at it. <laughs> I, I really appreciate it. Um, but why? So so can you explain why me talking to you when you're in a state where you're annoyed about something? Mm. Why does that bother you? I think it's just because, like, I mean, the, the mornings and the afternoons are two different times for me like in the afternoon yeah when I get home from school I just went through and this is for every kid uh they or we just went through eight or nine hours of social interactions and tests and papers and classes and so 
when you get home, the last thing you want to do is have a 20 minute conversation breaking down every little thing that happened at school. So that's what do you want to do? What, yeah. Well, what you want to do when I get home, at least, is I want to go to my room, maybe sit in there for a minute or two, kind of just be alone, hang out for a second. And then when I come back down to you, I'm more ready and willing to open up. But in the mornings, <laughs> this this may just be like a me thing, but I just like I wake up and <laughs> I'm just like. I just got to get out the door. Like, I don't want to be slowed down. Like, I'm super tired. Like, I'm upset that I just woke up. I was super happy being asleep. And I just, I feel like I'll be set off very easily if somebody's trying to, like, get my way and talk to me. I don't know if that's for everybody. Uh, Well, I think it's really helpful. And I also feel like if you've got a lot of stuff that you're processing and you're not ready to talk about it, there's nothing more irritating than somebody prying. Yeah, for sure. asking you to talk about it. And so... In terms of the answer to the question, why is it so hard to get sons to talk? There's the larger piece of it, which is all day long, sons and people that identify male are getting bombarded with the message that emotions are weak. Yep. Talking about how you feel is a weakness. Yep. And so it's getting reinforced and reinforced to just keep it inside. Mm -hmm. Second reason is they might be processing something and they're not ready to talk about it. Yeah. And prying makes you what? Uh, it, I mean, it makes me frustrated because I'm I still don't really know half the time. OK. So. And so do you have any advice? So let's say you and I get in a big fight because her second part of her question is when my 18 year old is upset, he stops talking to all of us. And you do that, too. I do. You remove yourself when you're mad about something. Mm-hmm. And. How do we re-engage with you? So if you have somebody in your life that removes themselves the way that Oakley does with us when he like is about to blow a gasket, mm-hmm. what is the best strategy? Just speaking from your shoes. Okay. How much time do you need? Mm-hmm. What's the best way to approach the topic yep. after you know, you've kind of pulled away? Okay. So if I get up to go, like don't stop me. I'm not trying to be stuck. Like, I'm just trying to leave. Like, I don't want to be a part of this conversation anymore. Okay. Um, For the piece about time, I think that it's just different for everybody and every situation. Like, if I'm more upset or less upset, it may take more or less time. And then to know when to re-engage and to try and have that conversation, I think I give like a subtle cue as in like I come back down into like a public space and I don't really say anything, but I'm just like hanging out. Maybe I'll try and eat something or do something, but I will be near you guys and I'll wait for you guys to engage. (laughs) It's true. I don't know if that's how everybody works, but I give a sign and I think most people do give a sign when they're ready to talk and my sign is I come back down. And uh, am I in a public space? And is there a lead in line that you would want to hear from me or dad? Mm, I just like, how are you feeling? Hey, bud. Like that kind of thing. Not like, hey, bud. I feel like that's kind of talking down. But okay. more just like, how are you feeling? Okay. Like, I noticed you're very upset. Like, would you like to talk about it? Would you like to talk about it? I like that. So acknowledge the feelings that you saw and yeah. then ask, would you like to talk about it? And I take it if. The person's like, no, you just mm-hmm. give them their space. Give them more space. Yeah. Okay, great. Actually, Ooh, yes. one more thing. Yes. You have a line. What do I have? Where it's, this is really good and I think everybody should use it. But if your child is willing to open up, it may be your first thought to jump right in and give advice and solve the problem. But you have a line that you use all the time, which is, do you want me to give advice or do you want me to just listen? And so if your child decides to open up, I recommend using that line because they might not want you to help solve their issue. They might just want to tell you what's going on and that's it. You never want advice is what I. Yeah, because I feel like I'm able to work things out most of the time. Most of the time. All right. We're going to probably go more and more into that because there were a lot of questions about how you broach topics with your teens and your young adults, how you build trust. And so let's do another one. How do you teach your kids about clicky behavior? Like fr- like friend group clicky behavior? Yeah. Yeah. Like what's your what's your whole take on clicks, Oak, and like what good, bad, how parents should support kids through it, how kids should think about it? Mm. Well, I remember there were clicks in my middle school. I wouldn't say there was as many at my high school, more just like friend groups. 
Mm-hmm. But what's the difference between a friend group and a clique? Well, I'll give my thing. I, maybe I'm wrong. I'd love for you to give me yours because I'm not 100% confident. But a clique is very closed off. They only engage with each other. They don't really like other, like maybe they don't, yeah, they don't really like other people. They don't really let other people in. And then like a friend group is just like, it's a group of people who you normally see hanging out, but they're never uh, not including everybody or stuff like that. Gotcha. Okay. Would you, would you agree with that? I feel like that's. Yeah. I think the word click, if you say the word click. It's negative. It's a negative word. And there's a certain group of people, whether you're an adult or you're a young adult or you're a teen, if I say the word click, there's a certain group of people that you immediately think of yep. because they're exclusive and they seem kind of judgy. Yes. Like, like, yeah, of course. Um, okay. So if you are outside of a click and there are people that you like inside of it, I would just stay away from the click. Okay. Um, chances are that the people inside of the click definitely hang out with other people and they don't talk about it with the, with the click. Like, you can still be friends with them. And if you are in a clique, I would recommend that you either change your ways in that clique or just leave it in general because it is not a very positive environment and people do not think very positively of it. That's true. Even if you think that's the popular girl clique, people still don't think positive of it. You should you should always take what makes you happy over like social standings. I would say like you don't need to hang out with the popular people to be happy. Okay. We got to go dig deep into that. How do you do that? Because we all think we need to be popular or we need to hang out with the popular people in order to be happy. I mean, like people feel happy when they're seen and you feel seen when you're in the popular crew because people know your name and they're saying hi to you in the halls and you're getting invited to the parties but when you like take a, a deep look into that group, you realize that half of them hate each other <laughs> or they talk shit about each other all the time. Right. Which I've heard on countless occasions at my school. Like there's a group like that and I've talked to them and they've said the worst things to their friends about their friends, which I would never imagine my friends saying about me. And it can definitely feel good to be recognized. But when you look back at your experience wherever you are you're going to realize that it was shallow and you weren't enjoying the people you were with and so to get out of that is my recommendation is find people who when you hang out with them you feel trust and you feel safe and you also feel enjoyment and you feel secure what does that feel like like how do you know for me it's like a gut feeling like when I see my friends I'm like those are my people like I know like they have my back and if you're unsure there will be situations that come up where they will take your back. Oh, they'll, they'll take your side. Um, oh, let me, th- let me think. Can you give me an example? Yeah. Like, have you been in a situation um, where you thought you were with your people, but then somebody did something and you're like, oh my God. Yeah, 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 yeah. So in my middle school, I wore, I think I might have told this story a little while ago, but like I, I wore jeans every day. And I was, I was friends with the popular boy group in my school and I was, I was happy about it. I thought I was, um, and I wore jeans every day to school. And the one day that I wore shorts, one of the guys in the friend group was like, your legs look so weird. And then they went around and told everybody that my legs look so weird. And then everybody was hitting on my legs. And there were a few dudes that were like, that's not cool. Like, don't do that. And I was like, those are the guys, like, those are my guys Mm. because those are the guys that are just standing up for me, even though. Maybe the popular dude isn't. I love that. And that leads right into this question. How do I help my son deal with kids who say hurtful things? He has a very hard time ignoring them. Mm. Um, I mean, when people say hurtful things, (laughs) what do you like? I just like. We got a lot of questions. You turn the page and I'm like, holy shit. Okay. um, (laughs) We have a lot of questions. um, And we'll get to them all. Um, When people say hurtful things to other people, nine times out of ten, it is because they are in a world of hurt right now. Yeah. Whether that be family, uh, friends, maybe academically, there's always something wrong with their life and they're taking out their frustration on somebody else. So you can know that 
because I believe that's true. But it still hurts. Correct. When people say things. So how in the moment when somebody says your legs are weird or they call you some name or they, you know, leave you out or, or something you've experienced is when you always end up being the person in a game mm -hmm. that's it. Yeah. So you're you're subtly getting picked on and excluded because the whole point of whatever game you're playing in phys ed or whatever, it's like, go after Oakley. Yeah. And you start to realize that everybody's out for you. Mm -hmm. So when it's happening, you can say to yourself, well, people are just doing this to me because they hate their life. But, and it, still getting bullied. Sucks. but it still sucks. So how do you, how do you cope with it? Well, this is a little bit different, but one way to make it go away. Yes. I think is just to not really react to it and honestly like make fun of it like be okay mm, how would you do this okay. with the legs like, how would you do this with legs? like agree with them okay they're like oh your legs are stupid and you're like yeah they do kind of look stupid I know it's funny isn't it and like you 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 go into it which makes them feel a little weird because they were expecting you to um be like oh my god you're like oh my goodness like yeah. this is so bad but if you joke about it with them, then they're kind of like, oh, what? Like, they don't really care. It doesn't go anywhere. It doesn't go anywhere. Right. And then they're like, oh, like, why why do anything to this person if they're not going to react in the way that I want them to? And what would you advise the adult in that kid's life, like the parent that's writing in this question? How, as a parent, can I support you? Because I would, I would expect. Right. I think as a parent, like, your first thought is just like reach out to the parents and make sure like I tell them that their kid is being a horrible person don't do that never do that never do what never reach out to like the bully's parent or the school or anything because for a middle schooler the last or, a, or even a high schooler uh the last thing that they want is for their parent to be getting involved in their social issue for for the kid to come up to them the next day, their bully to come up to them and be like, your parents just wrote mine and said I'm being rude to you. Like, you're the worst. Like, that's be all, end all horrible. But. But. There are. There are. Ex exce there exceptions. are exceptions. There are definitely exceptions. Exceptions when it's racist, discriminatory, when they're saying dangerous stuff, when you're yep. starting to feel depressed, when yep. you feel like yep. you can't handle it. Yes. Then you have to tell. Yes. A hundred percent. Then you have to do something. Oh, because, you're talking about the little shit. But I'm shit. talking about the little shit. Like, okay. I'm talking about the little stuff. Um, what you can do as a parent is you can be there for your kid. You can reach out. You can say, what can I do? You have to keep asking your kid what you can do because everybody's different. Everybody needs something different. Yep. But to show your kid that you are there for them is huge. Just like every day saying, hey, how was your day today? What can I do to support you? Things like that. You know, another thing you could do? Mm. Is you could rehearse comebacks. Oh, that's so good. That's so good. Didn't we I do that once? That. I bet we probably did. Yeah. Like, I love that. Like, what are you going to say? If you walk into that school and they do blah, 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 what are you going to say? Yeah, that's good. That's really good. Because then it also like <laughs> makes fun of it. And then they're like, oh, maybe they will pick on me today. And then I could use my comeback. And like, <laughs> oh, that is good. That is really good. Definitely okay. do that. Okay. And I'm also gathering though. That it is important to talk about this with your parents. Yes. Even if it's the little shit. Yes. Your message, though, to parents is don't get yourself involved in the little shit. Mm -hmm. If it starts becoming racist, dangerous, your kid is feeling uh, depressed, things like that, then you may want to you possibly definitely should. reach out. Yeah. Then you, you should, should reach out to the school, reach out to the parents. You want to do something. Um, but if it's little stuff, name calling, uh, teasing, just make fun out of it, basically. Or help your kid. Or help your kid. Or figure out what your kid needs. Like, because yeah. I think that this is like a constant theme is that your role. Well, you know what? Actually, I've got a question right here. Perfect. Um, What do teens need from their parents? Like what reminders, what role should we be playing? Yeah. Uh, the. Actually, last night. Uh oh I was, what did I do? You didn't do anything. I was at my school presenting parent tips to a bunch of parents. <laughs> <laughs> were, why were you doing that? Because I'm a senior mentor at my school, which basically means I'm assigned a group of first years who I look over and I can help with social issues or academic issues and things like that. And so I was asked by the school to come in last night and give a presentation to parents just saying, here's some tips for your new high school 
uh, ninth graders. So the freshmen, freshman parents. We don't call them freshmen. What do you call them? First years. First years. Okay. And uh, while I was there after my presentation, our headmaster got up and he gave a speech. And what he said, which I will repeat to you guys, is just that when you have a kid, you are a coach. And coaches never play in the game. They can give advice and they can watch, but they cannot get on the field. I'm like blanking on what the question was. But But so that's the role of a parent. That's the role of the parent. You can give advice. You can cheer. You can watch. um, You can support, but you can never step on the field. You can't play for your kid. You're just there for them. Got it. So that's what, and, and specifically, what are some of the things that every young adult and teenager needs to hear from the adults in their life or from their parents? That you're proud of them. Okay. That's huge. Um, that you love them. That's also very big. You're there for them to support them. Um, they want to hear that you like their friends. That's really important that you, that you're friends with people that they enjoy. Um, but what if you don't like their friends? Hmm. Well, what would you do if you didn't like my friends? Um, well, I would still want to act in a way as if I did. Yep. Because I know that if you felt like I didn't like your friends or I I was judgmental of your friends, you wouldn't bring them around. Yeah. And if you're not here, with your friends, I don't have eyes on you and your friends, yeah. and I don't know your friends. Yeah, and so it's important that I get a chance to know who you're hanging out with, and the only way that that's going to happen is if you and your friends feel comfortable coming over to our house. And yeah. so if I'm judgy of them, they're not going to feel comfortable coming here. Mm-hmm. If you think I don't like them, they're, they're not, not going to feel come. comfortable. And the other piece is, how could you possibly know if you like somebody if you haven't actually tried to get to know them? Yeah, definitely try and get to know your kids' friends. Yeah. Have conversations with them. Invite them. If they're spending the night, invite them to dinner with you. Like, Do all that to get to know your friends because they're a huge part of your kid's life. Actually, there's a research study that came out recently, or not even that recently, that said 97% of your child's success as a young adult, is based on the five friends they hang out with. Mm -hmm. Landmark study. And I think that's true. And so your only access point to change your child's friend group or to have an impact on them is to make them feel welcome so you get to know them. Yeah. Um, Here's another one. What do you like to do, Oak, when you first get home from school? That's a great one. I... Let's see here. School bell, school bell rings. Jump in the car. Turn on some music. Drive home. Having a good time. Pulling the driveway. Open the door. Dogs come running at me. I'm like, what's up, guys? I give them a little pet. <laughs> Walk around. Um, you, you might be working, so I sometimes don't come up here. Sometimes I do. Uh, I see if dad's work. I just like see who's busy. Like to be like, I'm home. Like, <laughs> Would I'm you here. like us? Be like, what up, Oak? I mean, an enthusiastic greeting is always lovely. Um, I I always appreciate that. Um, And then, I mean, if I'm hungry, I'll make myself a snack. But nine times out of ten, what I'll most likely do is just go up to my room after I've said hello and hang out there for 10, 20 minutes. Just get my bearings, you know. Decompress. Decompress. Just had a full day of studying, and now I'm just hanging out at home. And then, depending on what I need to get done, I'll get up and go do that. Gotcha. Uh, here's another one. My son is 14 and does not have a cell phone. Mm. Am I hurting him or helping him? I'm going to say helping him. What? For sure. For sure. Um, like everyone, including myself, like we are consumed by our technology. And you hear it everywhere and it's like you think it's cliche. But I, I fully agree with the fact that um, it practically runs our life. And so the later your child gets a phone, it's, I mean, it's not going to hurt them. But what about the bullying? Like you got a first year student that rolls into high school and he's not going to appreciate it in the moment. Like 
when he's there, he's going to be like, man, I wish I had a phone. Honestly, people wouldn't bully him for not having a phone. That's not something that people really get bullied about for. It's more of just like, oh, honestly, like you as a parent might get bullied by the kids <laughs> because your son doesn't have a phone. But um, I mean, your kid might be like, oh, I want a phone so bad or blah, 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 blah. But there's there's so much more to life than your phone. And to appreciate that when you're younger is super important. At what age would you say? Probably 16. Like once you're allowed to have a car, I feel like you're probably allowed to get a phone as well. But what about like you're at, like, I'm all, now I'm like playing the worried parent because I'm feeling this anxiety. Like, okay, but I'm running late and I need to reach you. And, and I'm, I'm like a flip phone. Oh, so a flip phone's cool. You're talking a smartphone. Uh, yeah. I mean like an iPhone, Android, like something like that. Got That so can access phone. like internet, like. Gotcha. So you're just talking a flip phone so you can text your kid. That is fine. Yeah. But you do not need a uh, full-on smartphone. No, because also everyone's going to have one. Like, everybody's going to have one. And I bet your kid probably has, like, an Xbox or a computer or something that they can also access and connect with their friends on. So it's not the end of the world if they don't have a smartphone until they're, like, 16. Um, Here's a question. Mom of a 17-year-old senior, mm -hmm. she has no clue what she wants to study in college yet. That is totally fine. I mean, I say to my friends and uh, whoever asks that I want to study psychology. Um, I've actually never taken the class before. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> why, why do you want to study psychology? Because like it's you, you kind of work in that field. And um, I, don't, I mean, you work in the wellness field of psychology. And I think it would be interesting to learn more about the human brain and things like that. I actually am taking the class now, but I haven't taken it before, but I came up with the idea to major in psychology way before I started the class. Um, and it's totally fine. Even when you get to college, I'm pretty sure you don't need to pick your major yet. Mm -hmm. yeah, and you, you may hear people say, oh, I already know my major. And it sounds like everybody does, but not a lot of people do. Nobody really knows what's going on. Gotcha. What do you eat for breakfast? What do I eat for breakfast? Yeah, listener wants to know. Really? Yes. That's a question? The, right there. Oh, I love you. Well, you know, like I just love to keep things fun. You know, it's serious, but you got to have a little fun. Um, that's a great question. It's also my answer is a trick question because I don't eat breakfast. <laughs> you don't eat breakfast? <laughs> no, I wake up in the morning and my one thought is like, get out the door, get in the shower, get out the door, <laughs> like go, go. So I... Uh, I mean, sometimes maybe I'll grab an apple or a banana um, on a good day, maybe a protein shake, but that's rare. Um, Can I ask a question? Yeah. Would it be helpful if I had breakfast ready? No, because nine times out of 10, I wouldn't eat it. Because also like my stomach like kind of hurts in the morning sometimes and I just don't really feel like eating. Well, that's why. And I wouldn't I... want the food to go to waste. Okay. Well, because I used to make you breakfast mm -hmm. and then you stopped wanting it because you said your stomach was hurting. So yep. then I just got in the habit of not doing it. But yeah. I'd be happy to make you a protein shake. No, I'm totally fine with you not. It's all good. Okay. But maybe we can get back into that rhythm. I might take a protein shake in the morning. Or a we'll bagel. See. I know I've thrown a, a bagel wrapped in foil. I at love you a good before. bagel wrapped in foil. You okay. Know? Like, okay. I'm... We can make some but, changes. But sometimes it might not work. Like sometimes it might That's be like, fine. get this away from me. Like, yes. Get out of here. Okay. And we know from answers earlier that when your child is angry, just give them the space. Exactly. Okay. Uh, listener wants to know, how, oh, this is actually a high school student. Oh, let's go. How can I be confident in class and participate more? Mm, that's good. Um, is it important to? It is very important to participate in class. Why? Uh, because one, it shows your teachers you're paying attention. And two, I think when I participate in class, it also helps me feel like I am uh, paying attention and getting what I need out of the class. If you are not already a senior, my one recommendation would be to take like a drama class because oh, just because those classes always go into uh, public speaking and all that kind of stuff. So if you aren't a senior and you got time, like take a drama class. They will teach you how to project. They'll teach you how to be more confident. Nine times out of 10, you'll probably have a show performance that you have to do at the end of the year where you will have to stand up in front of a group of people and say a few lines. So that, but if you don't have the time to do that, I think it's important to know that when you speak in class, people aren't going to be listening for you to mess up or 
they're they're not even going to be listening half the time. <laughs> Most of the time, like people are probably sitting in class, dead asleep, uh, doing their own thing, playing a game on their phone, texting a friend. Um, Is that your phone buzzing? Get it off the table. Was it buzzing? Yes. Oh, it was. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. Ugh. All right, where was I? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, uh, nine times out of ten, they're paying attention to their phones. They are not really present in class. But for you to get what you need out of the class, I do recommend that you uh, get your hand up and say something. Because the best way to get over your fear is to jump right in and do it. That's true. And I lo- what a fabulous suggestion. Never would have thought of that. Uh, Oakley, mm. what are you trying to improve on this year? Oh, love this. <laughs> um what am I trying to improve on this year? You know, I had a pretty good year last year. Pretty good year the year before. I just like, I just want to make the most of this year. Maybe that's not improving, but no, I want to improve my ability to be present and appreciate where I am and be happy because I know this year is going to fly by and I'm in love with where I am and I just want to be here and, um, keep it going. So I'm trying to improve my ability at being present right now. Uh, it, as your mom, it's just so amazing to hear you say, I'm in love with where I am right now. <laughs> oh yeah. No, don't, don't make fun. Of, that's I'm a not. big I'm fucking not. deal. Why are you in love with where you are? Like, what are the components because you haven't always I have not always been... loved where I have been. Um Well, I love the location. We're in a beautiful mountainy state. It's gorgeous. Uh I love my school. Uh I love my teachers. I love the sports I play. I love my friends. I love seeing them every day. Uh I love my family. Like I love coming home and seeing you guys every day. Um I feel like I just have so much that I love and value right here where I need it, like at my fingertips. And I, and I would say that I'm not taking it for granted. Of course not. But it's definitely just like, since I love it so much and it's moving incredibly fast. It is moving fast. Um, How do you encourage your kids to make friends without Mm. being pushy and them getting upset? Like, you know, how do you, how do you advise somebody like, cause we've all been in that stage where we want to be friends with people yep. and it's not reciprocated Yep. and you get needy yep. or you start to feel like they're leaving me out and mm-hmm. not everybody needs to be your friends. So how do you help somebody find their people and stay true to themselves? I would encourage them to sign up for after school sports clubs, um, get involved in things other than classes for Why? sure. Because those types of things really bring you, I mean, first off, if you sign up for a club that you're interested in, you'll be brought into a room of 20 other people that are interested in the same exact thing as you. So, I mean, instantly right there, like you're most likely going to make a connection. Um, But it also encourages you to go out of your way and try something new. And it gives you that skill to maybe branch out and say hi to somebody. But I would also just encourage them to... Uh, just like go for it sometimes. What does that mean? Like my fresh, my first year of high school, sorry, uh, can't we call on anybody a freshman? Um, my ninth grade experience, I didn't know anybody. I just moved from Massachusetts and if I saw somebody that I thought looked interesting, I was like, all right, like (laughs) I might make myself look like an idiot, but I just got to go up to this person and be like, Hey, like, what's up? Like, what are you doing? (laughs) Um, and I can assure you the first time I asked them to hang out, like that was awkward. I was like, so like, you don't know me want to do something. (laughs) And they were like, I guess (laughs) I was like, okay. Um, and it's also nice to reassure your kids that, uh, the first person you meet isn't always going to be your best friend. So if they do meet somebody, just let them know that like you shouldn't try and hold on to them right at the beginning because they may not be the person for you and you will find your people. Gotcha. Um, Let's stay in this lane. Mm -hmm. I'm in a new school where everyone seems to know each other Mm -hmm. and it feels like alone is written on my forehead. Mm. Hmm. Okay. Well, I can assure you that alone is not written on your forehead. 
I can promise you that. Um, I can promise you that if people are passing you in the hallway, they are not looking at you and saying, oh, this person has no friends. This person's so lonely. They're such a loser. Um, my advice to you, like I said a little bit earlier, is just sometimes you got to go for it. Um, not everything is going to be given to you. And the best way to grow or to have the best experiences is to put yourself out there. And so for you, I would recommend, again, joining a club, joining a sport. But also just if you see somebody doing something in the hallway, like let's say you are sitting in class and you look over to your right and someone's on their phone and they're playing like a phone game that you know and you really like it, just be like, oh, I love that game. Like this, like want to play it right now? Like let's, let's, let's do it. Um, and, and what if, what, how do you handle it when somebody like doesn't respond? I wouldn't take it personally because you also never know what other people are going through. Like maybe they didn't respond that morning because their dog just died and they're in a really shitty mood. Um, or they're just a horrible person, which again, <laughs> don't take personally because they don't hate you. They don't know you. They hate themselves. They hate themselves. But my advice to you is also just that you will meet people. You will uh, have friends and there are people out there for you. Uh, all you have to do is just take the first step and say something to anybody. Um, what about lunch? Like, what about sliding up to a table and being like, hi, I'm, I'm new at yeah, the school. I mean, Could I sit with you guys? If you're new, that is the perfect way to sit with somebody that you don't know. Because you lead with, oh, I'm new. Like, I don't know anybody. Like, I just, you guys looked cool. And then honestly, it's kind of a compliment to them because you're like, oh, like, you guys look cool. Like, I'm new. Can I sit with you guys? And they'll probably say yes. And if they say no, then you know that that's the friend group to avoid because that's the click that you don't want to be anywhere near. Correct. Excellent. Um, my son is a senior like you, Oak. Oh, yeah. Senior year. What's the best way to give him freedom but still get him to do chores? Mm. I mean. <laughs> I, I, I'm going to lean in and pay attention to when this it, one. When it comes to, yeah, I'm not the best at doing my chores. I'll be honest. I'll call myself out. When it comes to chores, like, you got to put your foot down sometimes. But I guess it depends on like what kind of chores you're uh, asking for. Like, are you controlling his life with the chores? Or is it like, can you empty the dishwasher every now and then? Um, if you're having him be your gardener every week and mow the lawn and p plant your flowers and wash your windows and all that, maybe maybe uh, give him a little bit of a break. Let him run free a little bit more. Um, but I mean, if it's like little things like clean your room, can you clean the kitchen for me today? uh do the dishes like many things that are only going to take him 30 minutes i wouldn't i'd say you're fine so how do you get them to do it though like because i think that's the yeah, thing to get them to do it i mean you just got to put your foot down like sometimes you got to be the bad guy well what i find with you is that getting you to remember to do it is impossible yeah, <laughs> yeah. but asking you to do it hey oak could you clear the table? Hey, Oak, could yeah, you feed yeah, the dogs? Yeah, 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 hey, Oak, yeah. could you help me with this? If hey, it's like Oak. a right then, like right then and there thing. Like if it's not like, can you do this in an hour? Because I'm going to forget in an hour. Or maybe I'll just be like, oh, it's fine. I don't know. It's been an hour. Like I don't need to. But I do notice you're extremely amenable when I ask. Yes. If you and I are face to face, we're sitting in the room and you're like, it's five o'clock. Can you feed the dogs? Yeah. If it's right there, they will do it. Clean the table, do the dishes. They'll do it. Like if you're there watching them, they're going to do it. And Let's say you're dealing with somebody who's got a lot of anger or grumpiness or has beef with their family. Mm -hmm. And so you as the parent, you ask them to do something and you get attitude. Like, because I think as a parent, where I typically want to go is, listen, asshole, <laughs> I pay the bills. Yep. You, well, get, you pulled you, that card a few times. I, I mean, haven't. Yes, what does that have. feel like? When it's that... annoying. It's so annoying. But, but I, it's understandable. It is very understandable. I think what's always kind of nice is you're like, oh, I'll help you out. Like, I'll, I'll do it with you. Like when dad's like, can you do the dishes? And I'm like, oh, and he's like, I'll do it with you. And then it makes it feel like less of a chore and a burden. That's cause true. Because you're, get, you're getting the help. That's true. So that might make them a little less angry. Um, what if there's like a, one of the things that I try to do is say things like, hey, could you help me out with this? Because I got something that I need to do over here. Yeah. Like that that's when I good. versus like, dude, do the dishes. Are you going to do yeah, the fucking that's, dishes? That'll make him like, angry, but you just be like, hey, like I really have to go do this thing right now. But if you could just do these dishes, that would be super helpful. 
Great. Okay. Um, this is from oh, this is a, an 11th grader. This is an interesting. Well, Anxiety like, is consuming me and I'm so scared. 11th grade. Mm, okay. Well, I think my first thing is that you're not alone. I think a lot of people feel it. I also have anxiety. Um, and it's very scary. It is very scary. And it, it can feel very consuming. Um, my anxiety, I'll, I'll give you a little peek into my window is what I get like. But when I was younger, I used to be very scared of throwing up. And so my anxiety morphed into this thing now, even nowadays, that whenever I'm anxious, I just feel as though I'm going to throw up. I never do, but I always feel like I'm going to throw up. And it was very overbearing. It was very uh, scary. And I felt very alone for a lot of it. And I felt very misunderstood. And my advice to you is that if it is feeling like you cannot live your life anymore. You should seek a therapist or you should tell somebody, maybe not a therapist, tell a parent, tell a friend, just tell anybody. That is huge. That's the first step because then you're not letting it run their, run your life. You're showing that you're in control. You can tell people what's going on. Can I ask a question? Yeah. So when you say you can't live your life, do you mean ang the anxiety is getting to a point where you're like opting out of doing things? Yes. You're yes. managing your anxiety mm -hmm. because your anxiety, you're so worried about your anxiety. That you're not, like not living your life. Like your friends are all hanging out and they're going out to dinner and you're too anxious. So you're just like, I don't want to be anxious. Like I don't want to go. That's, and that was you. That was me. So that's when you should start telling somebody. Um, I have two things I want to add on to that. I said something about therapy. Uh, therapy's great. I love therapy. I have a great therapist. And second is medication is also great. I, when I took medication as a kid, I was like, I'm different from everybody. Like I have to take medication because I have a problem. There's something wrong with me, but there's nothing wrong with you. If you take medication, I mean, every, like literally everybody takes medication. <laughs> like, <laughs> I take it. I take it all to Advil's like medication. Like there's nothing wrong with you. If you're taking medication for anxiety and honestly, if you're taking medication, like you're going to be able to live your life better. You're going to be able to go out to that dinner with your friends. You're going to be able to go on that walk or that run. You're going to have a good time. So. And so get, do what you need to do to get the anxiety under control. Yeah. And I recommend if you don't know where to start, just tell somebody. Tell somebody. And tell them everything. Like don't leave some stuff out. Don't be like, hey, I'm kind of anxious every now and then. Like be like, I am anxious and it is terrifying every day. Great. And here's the other thing. The tools and strategies that are out there actually work. Yeah, they do work. And anxiety is a, t is a scary thing, but it's temporary. If you follow the tools and strategies that work. It is 100% temporary. Yeah. Yeah. And you will feel better. The best feeling, I can assure you, is when you look back and you're like, I was at a bottomless pit and now... I'm outside and I'm looking back at it and I'm like, wow, like I felt that way. That's crazy. Yeah. You don't even, you can't even believe that you felt that bad. Mm -mm. That was me a year. Do you remember Mother's Day a year ago? I remember a lot of things a year ago. <laughs> I remember a lot. I remember a lot. When I was sobbing about the fact that we had sold our house and I was begging dad to try to get it back because I didn't yeah. want to move here. Yeah. I remember and, that. And you three kids were here. I and remember I, I like told my friends, I was like, guys, we're going to move back to like Massachusetts. <laughs> like my mom's like pretty sure this time <laughs> like, you should see her. <laughs> she is freaking. I was in a full blown anxiety attack. What was it like for you as a kid to see me lose it? Like really have a mental health breakdown? I think it was helpful and scary. How like, is it helpful? Because it's nice to know that your parents, uh, well, it's nice to know that your parents can break down and that like, if you as a kid see your parent as this strong, like tall, super emotionally put together person, that's how you're going to see them forever. And when you grow up and you see your parent break down for the first time, you're gonna be like, oh my goodness, like what? And so when I was a kid and I was young and I saw you break down, and I saw you break down again in the future. I was like, oh, like, this is just what happens. Like, people break down. Like, it's totally fine. Maybe not totally fine, but, like, 
It's fine. I was used to it. Yeah. You can't be happy all the time. Nobody's happy all the time. No. And life is going to be ups and downs. And I think you're right. It is helpful to watch the adults in your life process things and mm. realize that there are periods in your life where you're going to feel like you're in a bottomless pit. Yeah. And then all of a sudden the clouds pass and things are sunny again. Yeah. And that's just part of life. Yeah. And you don't need to share like the nitty gritty with your kids. You don't need to tell them everything that's like making you upset or why, but you know, let them in. Like they are a part of your family. They're there to support you. It's good to tell them how you're feeling and how you can be supported. Yeah. Um, my 14 year old son is dyslexic and feels Twins. different. <laughs> Twins. My 14 year old son is dyslexic and feels different and dumb mm. and shuts down instead of trying harder. Mm. Help. I like this question because when I was diagnosed with dyslexia as a kid, I was, I felt the same way. I was like, I'm so dumb. Like I can't read. I can't believe this. Like I'm dumber than everybody. And I like, remember you'd be like, well, the people on shark tank are dyslexic. And I was like, <laughs> shut the fuck up. Like I don't care about the people on shark tank. <laughs> they don't matter. All right. They could be dyslexic, but they're also multimillionaires. Like I'm, I'm 11. All right. What do I have? All right. I have $2 to my name. Um, <laughs> but, but what I'm going to say is that uh, there's a lot of techniques and skills you can learn to make dyslexia more manageable. Um, it's also different for everybody. Uh, it's different in that sense. Um, but you are not dumb if you are dyslexic. Um, you What's actually happening is that and correct me if I'm wrong on this, but like the scientific thing is that your neural, your, uh, your neural pathways like take longer to form. And so you can have the same uh, strong neural pathways as other people it just takes a little bit longer to get there. Is that, yeah. Is that right? Basically yeah. your brain wiring is a little bit different and there are techniques and strategies that you can use to, really like you basically had your dyslexia remediated yeah by you can you can have it like put it like pushed down yeah because you're you you just basically train your brain to wire and fire new neural pathway connections and it's called orton gillingham that is the gold standard uh tutoring method and so it's not about uh, trying harder and that's what is really important your brain learns differently and because you're dyslexic, you have profoundly different talents. Yeah. You know, you're being asked to sit in a classroom and do things that your brain is not firing to do. But I bet that you are way more creative than everybody else. Yep. I bet that you can solve problems in creative ways. I For bet sure. you are probably more talkative. Yeah, definitely. I bet you have much better profound spatial awareness, meaning you're phenomenal at video games mm -hmm. and at Legos and mm -hmm. about building things. Mm -hmm. And you're going to be an incre and you're an incredible problem solver. And so understanding that you've got these unbelievable talents that developed because other parts of your brain developed. Yeah. That is a superpower. For sure. And that's why so many entrepreneurs and actors and professors and people in the arts have dyslexia because by not having the neuropathways fully formed as it relates to reading and holding words in your mind and yeah. decoding words and, and also holding pencils and, and being yeah. able to write, you developed other parts of your brain. And mm -hmm. that's a really cool thing. And so first of all, I would say stop saying try harder. Yeah. And if you have not gotten the proper tutoring protocols put in place that really help and other things really help like being able to listen to books instead of reading yeah yeah yeah. i listen to books all the time yeah because like i i'm not the best reader so like i'm a little slow but listening to books is huge like that's great yeah and also being able to type instead of handwrite mm. there you can get the teacher's notes there are all kinds of things that help and you know i remember it was really interesting because you're an excellent math student yeah. but when professors or teachers require you to show your work, you basically fail because you can't explain the steps that you took to get there. Yeah. Your brain has I, all these I just shortcuts. I like can do it in my head and like I, can yes. write, I write down a few numbers just to remember things. But other than that, like I can't really. So if you have dyslexia, you're not dumb. All right. What you are, are you? Are, 
you are in, you're incredibly powerful in other aspects that aren't the school environment. Yeah. And that's perfectly fine because school is not your whole life. That's right. I love that. Um, that's a good one. I that's like a that really one. good one. Here's another <laughs> one. Uh, this person, this listener wants to know what your curfew is because she has an, an 18 year old high school senior who wants to negotiate a curfew later than midnight. Yeah. Your guys's thing is, um, if it's, I'm pretty sure it's like later than like 1231, just stay the night. Right. Yeah. I feel like that's not what you do. Cause like, it's not that your parents, I mean, for you guys, what you tell me, it's, it's not that you don't trust me on the road. It's you don't trust the other people. Correct. Cause at 2am you don't know who's driving. You Correct. don't know how they're feeling if they're intoxicated or not. And so if you want to go home and sleep in your own bed, you have to be willing to sacrifice the fact that you should probably be home by like midnight, midnight. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And so I, and if you want to be later, just spend the night at your friend's house. Well, and you know, here's the other thing. I, um, instead of curfew, I think about safety and location. Yeah. And keep in mind, it really relates to where you live. So we live in a rural area where there are no Ubers. And I am obsessive about the driving piece because yeah. I lost a family friend to a drinking and driving accident when I was in high school. Mm -hmm. And it was a really traumatic experience. And so I place more emphasis on being safe and on not driving mm -hmm. than I do on the curfew and the drinking or whatever else the kids may be doing itself. Mm -hmm. I want them to be safe. And so that's why I say midnight. Either you're going somewhere and you have to come home by midnight and that means you're not drinking and you're not smoking. You're not doing all this shit because you're coming home and I'm going to be there. Or you're going to stay overnight. And the same is true with our house. Nobody leaves our house. If yeah, you're coming no, to our yeah. house, if I'm not policing here. everybody because all these kids sneak shit. But I get the keys and you're spending the night. Yeah. Otherwise, you're not coming. Everybody or your parents are picking night. you up. Mm -hmm. And they respect it. They do. You have to enforce that, though, as a parent. Like, yep. Gotta... Um, do you want to be the, quote, house that all the friends come to? Oh my goodness. Okay. We are the quote house that all our friends come to. Um, and honestly, like love my friends, love them to the moon back. And they love this house so much. In fact, that they just show up sometimes without <laughs> me even knowing. Sometimes I won't be here and I'll get a text and I'll be like, yo, where are you? I'm here. And I'm like, I didn't invite you over. <laughs> and they're like, well, I'm here. Um, and I think, I feel like that's more of a question for you. Cause just like for me, like I always love seeing my friends and like we are able to accommodate them. So of course I'd love to be the house to have them. Well, are you, do you feel any pressure no. or is there anything on you that it's, you know, that everybody wants to be here? I mean, no. Cause like all my friends have come here so much that they get, they understand what works and what doesn't, what they can and can't do. And so it's gotten to a point where I don't really need to police anybody. Gotcha. And, it's, and it's really nice. Yeah. Um, and I, I mean, I'm a sucker for sleeping in my own bed. So that's you know, true. If all my friends are coming over, of course. But well, for you, it's your it's your house. Yeah. So. so so we've been this is our third rodeo because you have two older sisters yep. and we lived outside of Boston when they were in high school. And the fact is, I would have loved to have been the house. Mm. I grew up in a house that uh, kids hung out. Friends were constantly coming and going. Um, and we were not that house outside of Boston. We lived in a small farmhouse. It had a dirt basement yep. with a very short ceiling. And even when we ultimately cemented the basement, you could barely stand up in it. So that wasn't an option. We didn't have a playroom or a separate room for the kids to hang out in. Mm -mm. And, um, you know, it was just like a long, narrow house and kids, my, our daughter Sawyer didn't want to bring her friends there. Because they wanted to be doing all kinds of shit, right? You know, yep. that high schoolers yep. do. And all her other friends had basements or had party barns or had uh, like a playroom that became the teen hangout. And mm -hmm. so um, we never were that house. And I was always missing the energy and the fun and the just, just the commotion that comes when your house is the hangout house. And so I was really jealous of all the other families mm. who were constantly hosting the kids. When Kendall was in high school, she was a little bit more innovative and yeah, I think she they would came over a lot. Yeah, her friends her two or three girlfriends would come over and they'd sleep over at our house. Yep. But 
she had a couple parties where they would have them in the garage. Yeah, that was smart. That yeah. Was smart. Yeah. And our garage was kind of underneath the house. So they could the be down there. And... You didn't hear the music. Um, and so when we moved to Southern Vermont, one of the things that I really wanted is I wanted a place for the kids to be able to hang out without me being all over them or being angry that the music's loud or that they're trashing the place. And so um, when we moved here, I'm like, I am successful enough at this point at the age of 54 that I can afford to build a small outbuilding barn thing. Yep. And what I said to the person who built it is, if somebody takes a pool cue and chucks it across this room. room, I do not want it to hit anything that I'm going to be pissed off that it breaks. And there's there's nothing in there that yeah. can break. <laughs> there's nothing. Um, and so I love it because I love having the kids around because I didn't have that with our other daughters. And I also love it because I've gotten to know them really well. Mm -hmm. And I also love it because um, it keeps you here. Yeah. Which I And I love having you around. And there's one tip, though, that I'm going to give to everybody listening. I, I'm listening, too. I mean, I'm, I'm interested. Do you know what the tip is? Probably. Okay. Set some ground rules. Is that well, I love having all the kids here, but I'm not your fucking maid. Right. That's okay. Right. So like if I'm hosting you kids, don't, don't turn me into your maid. Which we don't. No, you don't. And do not like turn me in, like do not make me feel like I'm getting taken advantage of mm -hmm. and do not make a big mess for me to clean up. And so mm -hmm. I have sat all of Oakley's friends down. I've made it very clear. You're welcome here all the time. And I have two rules. You need to leave this barn the way you found it, mm -hmm. which means the trash in the trash, the counters wiped down, the shit put away that you pulled out, mm -hmm. and you have to make the bunk beds. It's a religious thing. Like every morning after we wake up, we're just like, all right, like make the bed. Like there's photos. That's in it. The Tell them what room. I did. Yeah. So she actually <laughs> did sit everybody down. And like, <laughs> I actually fully recommend that. Actually, before I go on, I would like to say one thing about the do you want the, the house. If you're not the type of person that doesn't want a bunch of kids running around your house, you don't have to be the house. Like, yes. If you want that and you can have it, go for it. It's so much fun. Fully recommend it. But if you don't want it, don't do it. It's not the end of the world. Um, but to go on, uh, you sat everybody down. You talked to them. And if you're worried that the kids are going to think you're the bad guy or you're evil, like they know. They understand that it's your house and you have a few rules. And my friends are totally fine with it. And so... My mom printed out a step-by-step -step, like photo thing that's <laughs> in the bunk room still. And it's just there. I mean, we don't even need to look at it anymore because we know it by heart. But it's like we wake up, make the beds, go out, clean the room. And then, yeah, it's it never takes that long. Like, it's always good. Well, and here, what he's talking about is bunk beds are a pain in the ass oh to make. God, the top ones are such a pain. And but we still do it. Yes, because I'd be angry <laughs> if I were the one doing it. Yeah. So... You guys, seriously, I made the beds and then I took photographs of how they're made. And we make them the pull same Pull the sheet up, way, pull like... it back, tuck it in, fold the comforter, put it down, mm -hmm. take the two European shams, yep. stick them in front of the pillows. <laughs> yep. There is a step-by-step -step photo guide. And I'll tell you what. These 17 and 18 year old boys make a fabulous bunk yeah, bed. You, you'd think they're like interior designers. Like they set the pillows <laughs> up perfectly. Like it's great. It's great. But you know what I love about it is, first of all, when you have that talk ahead of time, I think teenagers and young adults respect you because you're respecting them. Mm -hmm. Secondly, they know what's being asked of them. Mm -hmm. So it's not a situation where they're having a party and you stomp in there and start screaming at people, which yeah. I've also done. You have done that. Um, but I also think when you say this is how you can be successful at my house, people want to do something to say thank you. Yeah. And so I feel like I earned more respect and your friends know how to be respectful in a way that I care about because of that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And your kids will be mortified when you do it, but do it anyway. They'll be mortified, do it anyway. But also, one more thing is don't make your kid do it because your friends are going to – if you're if you're making your kid be like, guys, my mom wants you to make the beds. They're, they're not going to do it. They're not yeah. going to do it. All right, Oak, what's your final – like, I know we're going to get bombarded with even more questions after this. Is there going to be a part two? Yes, so we're going to do a part two because, dude, I'm only halfway through my stack, and I know we're going to be bombarded – with more. So you down for part two? I am down for part two, part three. 
part four. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Um, I'm getting a lot out of this, actually. I am, too. I'm loving this. I love the questions. I'm loving the questions everyone's asking. I am, too. Um, and so part two coming up. Thank you for all your questions, everybody. Anything you want to say in closing? Uh, keep asking questions. Keep being curious, you know? And uh, yeah. Just... How do you get your son or daughter to listen to this? Like if you're the parent and you've heard this. Mm -mm, trap them in the car. Like you're like, go, <laughs> you're like going somewhere, be like, turn this on. Like, let's listen to this. But you could also, I mean, they might not really care that somebody close to their age is listening to it. But um, actually two things, two okay. things, two things, two things. One, okay, three things, three things. <laughs> okay. So trap them in the car because that's always a great way to do it. Be like, give me your headphones. Like, just listen to this. Sometimes you got to force it. Two is maybe they don't want to listen to a full hour. So find a 10-minute segment that you really like and just be like, can you listen to this 10-minute segment with me? Um, I think you'd take something out of it. Like, it relates to something that I think you might be going through. And then what was the third one? Uh, three, I don't know if this one's going to work, but just say that. There's a kid who's close to their age talking in it and voicing his concerns and stuff. Awesome. I love that. I, uh, yeah. Another piece of great advice, Oak. Thank you. You're so wise. You must get it from your dad. I think so. I think so, too. All right. Well, in case no one else tells you today, I want to tell you I love you. I love you, too. And I believe in you. I believe in you as well. And um, I believe in your ability to create a life that you love. I do, too. Now go do it. Yes, you should. All right. We'll talk to you in a few days. Bye, guys. Bye. Is the audio recording? Oh, wow. We're in. We're, We're in. in. <laughs> it's happening. Going to be doing this the whole time. You Don't like you that? dare. Uh-uh. <laughs> Give me one good clap now. You want to do it? Go no, for you it. Go for you it. go for it. It's all you. I know you want to do it. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, ready? Oh, my goodness. Sorry. I need to, like, burp. Okay. Ooh, perfect. Oh, perfect. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, this one? Okay, yeah. I'll make sure to keep my hand away. Oh, that is so good. What? That answer. What answer? The one that you just gave. To what? I'm teeing you up to go into the ad break. Wait, what? I'm so confused. <laughs> oh, and one more thing. And no, this is not a blooper. <laughs> this is the legal language. You know, what the lawyers write and what I need to read to you. This podcast is presented solely for educational and entertainment purposes. I'm just your friend. I am not a licensed therapist and this podcast is not intended as a substitute for the advice of a physician, professional coach, psychotherapist, or other qualified professional. Got it? Good. I'll see you in the next episode. Too. If you loved this, and of course you did, uh, Oakley did a whole episode about how he dealt with his anxiety for real. Just go here. You're going to love it.